It's a well-established fact that in relation to serious aircraft incidents and accidents, such events are unlikely to occur as the result of one specific issue in isolation. In reality, those with expertise of the subject matter for the most part concur that such incidents and accidents are likely to transpire when between five and nine occurrences or interacting events are linked together, forming what's more commonly known as an error chain. As such, the reality, particularly with advancements in technology, is that an accident is unlikely to result from a single point of failure, such as the loss of a single hydraulic circuit or engine. Rather, a series of events will most likely transpire, which when combined, can often lead to devastation. These chain elements do, however, follow a pattern and are commonly identified with the occurrences of ambiguity or occasions where two or more sources or persons fail to agree. Fixation or preoccupation, where an individual or individuals excessively focus their efforts and attention on any one item or event to the exclusion of all others. Confusion, characterised by a sense of uncertainty or anxiety in the context of an event. A lack of monitoring in relation to the flight's progress, in other words, no one flying the aircraft. And in a similar vein, no one looking out the window where flight crew adopt the heads-down, introspective approach, resulting in loss of situational awareness as to what's actually happening in the world around them. With the use of undocumented procedures, crew members have been observed to deliberately deviate away from defined and established manuals and checklists, particularly in the context of abnormal or emergency situations. Additionally, another significant issue of note is the violation of limitations or minimum operating standards. Observed instances where deliberate and intentional deviation away from minimum standards, such as those applied to weather operations, aircraft performance or indeed terrain separation, to name but a few. Also the failure to resolve discrepancies, specifically where crew members retain differing impressions or opinions as to what their objective is, or more accurately, the failure to ensure the existence of a common viewpoint. And finally, the very simple act of deliberate departure from standard operating procedures, particularly in an effort to save time. In the context of independent Air 1851, the error chain which led to its demise on the summit of Pico Alto, a relatively small mountain ridge in the central highlands of Santa Maria, an island of the Azores archipelago, left even the most experienced of investigators completely stunned. This is the story of that error chain and the confluence of events which led to the loss of the aircraft and the lives of all 144 souls on board. This is the complete story of Independent Air 1851. Independent Air had been founded in 1970, the offspring of a travel company based in Atlanta, Georgia. During the decade which followed, the airline exclusively leased its aircraft back to its original parent company to facilitate the provision of organised leisure trips for its members. Identifying a business opportunity to expand, in 1981 the airline applied to the USFAA for and was granted Part 125 approval. What this meant was that the airline was now approved to offer its services to a much wider private audience while simultaneously being prohibited from selling tickets to the general public at large for scheduled commercial flights. As such, Independent Air had moved with purpose into what is more commonly referred to as the charter market. In anticipation of this expected growth in business, the company had purchased two Boeing 707s from TWA. However, come 1984, their approval to operate the aircraft was rescinded with introduction of new noise regulations in the US. Following a successful legal challenge a year later, on foot of capital raised from a public offering for the company, both aircraft were fitted with hush kits, allowing the 707s to comply with the new noise regulations, and operations resumed. Although fitted on foot of federal regulation, ironically, the addition of these hush kits would, some four years later, play an unintentional and most definitely unforeseen part in the loss of 1851, and so arguably became the very first, if admittedly loose, link in the chain of events which were to follow. As business grew, Independent Air pushed ahead into the growing tour operators market and also carried out transports for the US military, 
Frequently, the hard-working aircraft were seen operating ad hoc routes from the US to Europe, the Caribbean and South America. Indeed, by the 1988-89 season, the company was flying between four and 500 charters annually, most between the American and European continents, where Santa Maria in the Azores was routinely used as a non-route technical stop in order to refuel. However, all was not as it first appeared. Following the accident, reports of the company's poor financial position had started to appear in the media, with the New York Times labelling it small and unprofitable. In reports filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission, the company stated that it had sold the 2707s the previous year to a company in Florida which was not affiliated with Independent Air and was leasing them back. The arrangement, it said, had helped raise valuable capital for the company, which continued to be responsible for the maintenance and operation of the jets. According to Independent Air's annual report, filed nine months prior to the accident, and its last quarterly report filed the previous November, the company had assets of less than $6 million and retained less than 60 employees, 10 of which were pilots. In the nine months to September 30th, 1988, five months before the accident, it reported net losses of $872,000, with its net loss for the preceding year of 1987 being upward of $3.3 million. Thus, it was against this financial backdrop that the crew of 1851 had found themselves boarding their 707 on the ramp at Orio El Ciero, on the outskirts of Bergamo, Italy, on the morning of February 8, 1989, for what was to be the 21-year-old 707's last ever flight. But in reality, the story of 851 actually started some five days earlier. On February 3rd, the crew had flown from the US to Montego Bay, Jamaica. After a short layover the following day, they had flown to Fort Worth, Texas, before continuing on to Denver, Colorado. The day after, on February 5th, they again returned to Montego Bay, where they received their assignment for flight 1851 from Bergamo to Punta Cana in the Dominican Republic, with the scheduled stopover in Santa Maria. After a 10 hour and 40 minute flight across the Atlantic, the crew finally arrived in Genoa and not the intended destination of Bergamo due to adverse weather. Having taken rest in a local hotel on the morning of February 8th, they attempted to relocate the aircraft a short distance to Bergamo in order to commence the intended westbound trip to Punta Cana. Again, however, struggling to beat the elements, they were further delayed due to localized fog in the area only arriving in Bergamo at 8.20 local, just 40 minutes prior to their scheduled departure time. As such, 1851 was delayed, with its subsequent departure now occurring just after 11. As the 707 headed west across southern Europe, in command was Captain Douglas Leon Doherty, age 41. Doherty had just over 7,500 hours of total flight time, 770 of which had been obtained on the 707, and just under half of that in the left seat as captain. By a considerable amount, his greater experience as a captain had been gained previously on the Boeing 727, where 1,900 of a total of 2,300 hours were spent in the left seat of the trijet. An avid flyer, his career had included time spent as a helicopter pilot in the US military, as well as flying these civilian jetliners for nearly a decade. 
where his colleagues characterised him as being very professional, both inside and outside of the cockpit. Alongside Doherty and occupying the right-hand seat of 1851 was First Officer Samuel Sammy Adcock, aged 36. Only two weeks with Independent Air, he was reported to have been very excited about his new job. Not surprisingly so, his experience in the 707 was limited, with just 64 hours having been previously logged. In fact, this was his first jet position, with the remainder of his 3,700 hours total time having been amassed on smaller turboprops with various regional carriers throughout the US. To the rear of the cockpit and operating the flight engineer's station was 2nd Officer George Gonzalez, aged 34. He too, with a previous career in the military, had amassed just over 2,800 hours on the Lockheed C-5 Galaxy, while as a civilian he'd also racked up an additional 2,900 hours on the 727. Of the three cockpit crew members, it was Gonzalez who actually had the most time on the 707, with just over 1,000 having been logged on the panel. With the addition of four cabin crew members, Sabrina Cromarty, Angela Urban, Helen Ziegler and Yvette Murray, this brought the total crew complement to seven. Murray, aged 26, had actually been engaged to Doherty, with the couple planning to marry the following May. In the cabin were 137 passengers, all Italian nationals, tourists and holiday makers, who had booked their trip with a consortium of six local travel agencies, who, for the four months previous, along with tour operators in the Dominican Republic, had been chartering Independent Air 707 jets in order to provide a much sought after escape from the sometimes harsh European transalpine winter. And so it was that in light of the 707's fuel endurance, these 137 passengers had found themselves en route to Santa Maria that morning, in anticipation of a brief and routine refuelling stop before heading on to the sunnier climes of the Caribbean. For most, if not all, it was their first time to visit the Atlantic Archipelago, if all but briefly. Indeed, in that regard, they were not alone, as on the flight deck Sammy Adcock was also looking forward to a career first, as he contacted Santa Maria Oceanic in order to obtain the necessary air traffic control clearance to enter their particular airspace. This clearance was obtained at 12.46, approximately an hour and 35 minutes prior to the accident. And what will categorically be identified as the first link in the subsequent accident error chain, Adcock will struggle to fully comprehend the clearance issued to 1851. Assumptions will be made on the part of both the crew and controller, a human fallibility, which will start 1851 down a path leading to its own destruction. The following will reconstruct the narrative between First Officer Adcock and the Oceanic Controller as recorded on the air traffic control tapes. Given that the aircraft was operating over the Atlantic at a distance well beyond the range of land-based radar stations, the controller issued 1851 with what's called a procedural clearance. This comprised of a route along which the aircraft had been cleared to fly at a given altitude and speed deviation from which is only allowed in the event of an in-flight emergency. St. Maria Oceanic clears independent 1851 to proceed via Makin 38 North 20 West, Echo, Sierra Mike Alpha, Flight Level 350, Met Decimal 80. Go ahead, your read back. Roger, understand independent 1851 is cleared to Mackin, 38 North 20 West, to Echo, maintain flight level 350. Adcock's readback of the clearance was incomplete, having omitted the final waypoint and the cleared route of flight, that being the Sierra Mike Alpha beacon, as well as the required speed at which the aircraft had been instructed to fly. As a result, the Santa Maria Oceanic Controller again attempted to contact 1851 in order to verify that the complete clearance had indeed been received and understood. Independent 1851, Santa Maria, after 20 West will be Echo Point, Echo Point, then Sierra Mike Alpha, flight level 350, net decimal 80. Over. 
Okay, after 3820 it is Echo Point, then Santa Maria. Yet again despite the Portuguese controller's efforts to bring clarity to the situation, Adcock once again failed in his attempt to provide a satisfactory readback. Significantly however, more important than just poor radio discipline, Adcock's reply introduced an extremely subtle but nonetheless critical ambiguity, the implications of which were lost not just on him but also the other members of his crew and likewise the controller himself. After correction, your met number is 80 when you need your cell phone. In what appears initially to have been a further effort on the controller's part to clarify the routing, he momentarily hesitated, then belatedly appeared to accept Adcock's assertion that with 1851 proceeding to Santa Maria after passing the Echo Waypoint, this was finally the confirmation that he had been seeking and thus he was of the opinion that his clearance had indeed been understood. Having heard the interaction between the controller and Adcock, in order to fully understand the subtlety of what has just happened, and the monumental impact it was to have on the following events, it's necessary to have a closer look at the geography of the local area as Flight 1851 approaches the island. Correctly, Doherty and his crew were of the belief that on passing the Mackin Waypoint, which lies on the extreme eastern boundary of Santa Maria controlled airspace, they were to proceed to the grid point located at 38 degrees north, 20 degrees west. From here there would be a slight course correction as the aircraft continued to the Echo Waypoint, some 20 minutes flying time to the east northeast of the island. But it's what happens thereafter which lays the foundation stone for everything which will subsequently transpire that afternoon. With his initial clearance, the controller had been very specific in that the remainder of the route would have the aircraft track from the Echo Waypoint to the Sierra Mike Alpha Beacon. The Sierra Mike Alpha is a low-powered non-directional beacon situated to the north of the runway 19 threshold and typically used to facilitate short-range navigation towards that specific landing runway rather than for en route navigation which by definition would require beacons with a substantially greater power output. Such an en route aid was in fact located on the island, actually within the airport boundary. Known as a VOR or very high frequency omnidirectional beacon, it was similarly identified by its three letter ident, Victor Sierra Mike. Finally, another NDB identified as Sierra Tango Alpha was located to the south of the runway 01 threshold again to facilitate navigation to that particular runway when in use. Although admittedly each of the beacons had a unique three-letter identifier, respectively each could also be identified by a plain language name, and in this regard all three were identified simply as Santa Maria. Thus when the controller had issued the original clearance to proceed to the Sierra Mike Alpha beacon, having passed the Echo Waypoint, his intentions for the crew were unambiguous. However, with Adcock's ill-disciplined reply that 1851 would proceed to Santa Maria after Echo, based on what we know now, which Santa Maria had he meant, and what of the controller's understanding? It can only be assumed that the controller's hesitation and failure to correct Adcock for the second time was proof positive that he was of the understanding that Adcock had indeed meant the Sierra Mike Alpha Santa Maria Beacon. Although having issued such a clearance in the first instance, he was in all probability biased towards such an interpretation. As for Adcock and the rest of the crew, well, it was common practice at the time both in the US and Europe to anchor air traffic routings and holding patterns over the primary navigation aids, namely VORs, if such an aid were present. Thus, without any apparent written prohibition to do so, Doherty had erroneously chosen to navigate towards it, that being the Victor Sierra Mike Santa Maria Beacon, rather than the controller's intended Sierra Mike Alpha. Indeed, in the subsequent investigation, this course of action was verified by the Morse code identifier of Victor Sierra Mike being clearly heard on the cockpit voice recorder at 1346 Zulu, just 22 minutes before the accident confirming that a deliberate effort had been made on the part of the crew to tune the VOR beacon.
But why, if Victor Sierra Mike was the primary and more powerful navigation beacon, had the controller opted to direct 1851 towards the Sierra Mike Alpha to the north of the airport? And why, at the end of the day, was it important which beacon was actually used at all? The weather generally across the island was good, so did it really matter? Historically, specifically with regard low-flying aircraft approaching the island from the east, the reception quality of the VOR signal had been compromised due to a ridge of terrain rising to an elevation of about 2,000 feet and running pretty much north-south to the centre of the island. As such, the direct approach to the Victor Sierra Mike could on occasion prove difficult and thus a track to the northern beacon was often preferable. Had this information been promulgated by way of a notice to foreign crews using the airfield, or indeed published on official navigation charts, Doherty may well have been prompted to question his decision. In reality, however, there was no such official guidance, with awareness of the potential difficulties simply being attributed to local knowledge. With regard to the importance of which beacon was actually used, in reality there really wasn't any, or at least in theory there shouldn't have been. On days where the weather was good, pilots once visual with the airport could align themselves visually with the landing runway, whereas on days where this wasn't possible due to inclement weather conditions, once overhead the respective beacon, whichever that happened to be, the aircraft could turn initially away from the airport and proceed in a reciprocal direction to the landing runway. This, regardless of whether the aircraft was tracking north or south, would take it out over the water where it could safely descend below cloud before reversing its direction of travel and thus aligning itself with the intended landing runway. But having said this, traversing the island from east to west while navigating towards the Sierra Mike Alpha NDB or the Victor Sierra Mike via war had very different implications in the context of terrain separation. A routing from the Echo Waypoint out to the east to the Sierra Mike Alpha NDB would have an aircraft track pretty much along the northern shoreline of the island and well clear of the central highlands mentioned previously. The depiction here is what a crew would observe in good weather as they navigated along this route to the north. In contrast, routing from the Echo Waypoint to the Victor Sierra Mike, as Doherty had done, would take the aircraft directly over the highlands and in particular across the summit of the island's highest peak of Pico Alto, at an elevation of 1,925 feet or 586 metres. Again a depiction of the more southerly routing. Given the obvious terrain implications, in order to guarantee the safety of inbound traffic, particularly with an airport having no radar facility, the minimum safe altitude for the area had been set at 3,000 feet. What this meant was that inbound aircraft were prohibited from descending below this altitude until letting down over the water, ensuring that a minimum clearance of 1,000 feet would be preserved at all times with regard the highest terrain in the area. The fact that 1851 was operating beyond the radar coverage of all land-based facilities, the crew were procedurally required to make routine position reports as they transited the various waypoints along the route. And so at 1301 Zulu, an hour and seven minutes prior to the accident, Adcock reported to Santa Maria that the aircraft had transited the Maxin waypoint and had, as a result, entered that part of Atlantic airspace known as the Santa Maria Oceanic Sector. Santa Maria, Independent 1851 is Mackin at 1255, flight level 350, estimating 38 north 20 west at 1327. Echo is next. Santa Maria acknowledged Adcock's position report 
with the additional instruction that 1851 report the next waypoint passage, that being 38 degrees north, 20 degrees west, on the VHF frequency of 127.9 MHz, with a backup, should reception on the primary frequency prove difficult, of 8825 kHz on HF. Independent 1851 Maki 1255, flight level 350. Estimating 38 north to 0 west at 1327, and echo next. Next report to 0 west on Victor 1279, 1279, and secondary 8825. Santa Maria. As 1851 approached the island of Santa Maria, and slightly in advance of their passing of the Echo Waypoint, 2nd Officer Gonzalez, from his position at the Flight Engineers Panel, called ahead to approach control in an effort to obtain the airport's latest weather report. Santa Maria, Independent Air 1851 1851, Santa Maria, go ahead. Good morning, sir. I'd like to request your current MET report. Simultaneously working both the approach control frequency and the tower frequency that afternoon was a trainee controller under the supervision of his shift manager, both of whom's identity remained anonymous with publication of the final report. 1851, wind, 260, 14, a 14 knot, maximum to 4 knot. Visibility more than 10 kilometers. One octet 1200 feet, six octet 3000 feet. A temperature 17, QN rate 1019. -er. With this meta observation of significant importance to the series of events which were about to follow, was the controller's report of the local QNH or sea level pressure reading as being 1019 hectopascals. Without getting into the mechanics of how an aircraft's altimeter actually works, it suffice to say that the principle is one of pressure sensing and subsequent comparison with the known datum. As atmospheric pressure decreases with altitude, the difference in pressure sensed between where the aircraft is in the atmosphere and the pressure datum the device is calibrated to can be converted into a display of altitude on the understanding that barometric pressure drops by approximately one hectopascal for every 30 feet of ascent. When flying at high altitude, the universal practice is to have the altimeter set to a datum of 1013 hectopascals. The reason for such a practice is simple, safety. With all aircraft flying at high altitude relative to one specific pressure datum, there's no need to constantly readjust for changes in sea level pressure with transit from one geographic area to the next, allowing for consistent traffic separation. These altitudes, referenced to the 1013 hectopascal datum, are called flight levels. Thus, when an aircraft reports flying at a flight level of 60, it's actually flying at 6,000 feet above this particular datum. An aircraft below, at flight level 50, will be flying at 5,000 feet above the 1013 pressure datum and thus 1,000 foot separation would be maintained regardless of any potential changes in the sea level pressure below. However, although this solution is practical and works very well for flight at higher altitudes, the model has significant limitations in the context of aircraft taking off or landing. The reason is fairly straightforward. One of the fundamentals of cartography is that terrain elevation is referenced to height above sea level. Thus, during these portions of the flight, the pilot's altimeter must display the aircraft's altitude above sea level in order that he be able to make a direct comparison between the altitude he is flying at and the elevation of the terrain in his immediate vicinity. This requires that the altimeter be recalibrated to a revised, more relevant datum, that being the local value of sea level pressure, or in aviation speak, the current Q and H value. In the example shown, with the highest elevation on the island being that of Pico Alto at 1,925 feet above sea level, 
A pilot flying his aircraft at 3,000 feet relative to the current Q&H value of 1019 hectopascals, which is the minimum safe altitude for the area, will be aware that he has a satisfactory 1,100 feet of terrain clearance above the peak summit. With all this in mind, six minutes before actually reaching the Echo Waypoint, 1851 will request and receive a descent clearance in preparation for its landing at Santa Maria. Santa Maria Control, Independent Air 1851, we'd like to descend. In the background, the cockpit voice recorder area microphone clearly recorded the Morse code of Victor Sierra Mike as the crew tuned in and identified the VOR navigation beacon in anticipation of their final track adjustment with the passage of the Echo Waypoint. Independent Air 1851, cleared to descent to flight level 40. Roger, Independent Air 1851, understand we're cleared to descend to flight level 40. The aircraft is now just 20 minutes from impact with the summit of Pico Alto. Also recorded on the cockpit voice recorder over this time period was a considerable amount of social chit-chat of no operational relevance between the flight deck crew and what appeared to be a visitor to the cockpit. This visitor, in most accounts, is believed to have been one of the on-duty flight attendants, although there's also some speculation that it may alternatively have been one of the tour guides travelling with the Italian passengers. Regardless of who this person actually was, their presence on the flight deck during this period is accepted as fact. Why this is important is that critically, during this time period, 1851 reported passing the Echo Waypoint and was thus handed off to the tower controller at Santa Maria Airport. The interaction, which immediately followed between 1851 and the tower controller, was to introduce yet another link in the error chain, which ultimately doomed Doherty, his crew, and all the passengers on board. Although conjecture, the crew's failure to identify and question the next transmission, some suggest may have been in part due to this unnecessary conversational distraction during what was a critical phase of the operation. Independent Air 1851, what's your passing level? Passing flight level 220. Roger, report echo. Roger, report echo, Independent Air 1851. Within only a few seconds, 1851 passed the Echo Waypoint and notified Santa Maria of the fact, who in turn handed the aircraft off to the tower controller at Santa Maria Airport. Independent Air 1851 is Echo at the present time. Roger, Independent Air 1851. Contact Santa Maria Tower now 118.1. 1181. Good day. Good afternoon Santa Maria Tower, Independent Air 1851, passing flight level 200 for flight level 40. With the initial handover it would be customary for the controller to verify the route of intended flight. However this wasn't done in this instance, and thus without any assistance of radar, the flight's course correction to the Victor Sierra Mike VOR beacon wasn't noticed by anyone on the ground. The assumption still that 1851 was proceeding to the Sierra Mike Alpha to the north of the airfield, and so yet another opportunity to avert disaster was lost. As mentioned previously, despite the frequency change from approach control to tower, the same trainee under supervision was managing both, a practice which is not completely uncommon at airports with low traffic volumes, as was the case with Santa Maria on the day in question. While the trainee controller issued 1851 with a further descent clearance, critically 
This interaction wasn't overseen by the supervisor, who was distracted by an incoming call on the tower's telephone landline. I say critically, because in issuing the further descent clearance to 3,000 feet, in error, he passed the Q&H as 1027 hectopascals, rather than the correct value of 1019. Independent 1851 Roger. You were cleared to 3,000 feet on Q&H 1027, and runway will be 19 The implication of such an error had the potential to be significant if undetected. While flying at 3,000 feet reference to the correct pressure datum of 1019, the aircraft would indeed be maintaining this true altitude above sea level, with a resultant terrain separation from Pico Alto of just under 1,100 feet. However, just as we have established that atmospheric pressure decreases with altitude, the converse is true, in that atmospheric pressure will increase with the decrease in altitude. Thus, this erroneous 1027 pressure datum by its very nature will be located somewhere below the 1019 datum, effectively meaning that in this scenario it will actually reside at a level below current sea level. The magnitude of this displacement equates to approximately 30 feet per hectopascal change. In other words, the reference datum will have been shifted by approximately 240 feet. In descending to an indicated altitude of 3,000 feet, reference to a datum of 1027 hectopascals, rather than 1019, AD and 51 were actually maintaining a true altitude of not 3,000 feet above sea level, but rather only 2,760, with the terrain clearance over Pico Alto being reduced, therefore, by a similar margin from 1,075 feet to just 835. Had this been the end of the matter, the reduction in terrain separation would have been classed as a serious incident, most probably resulting in additional training for the controller and a review of local procedures. But regrettably, the story of 1851 won't end there. In the cockpit of the 707, what Adcock heard was not a clearance to 3,000 feet, but rather 2,000. This possibly due to the controller's heavily accented English. Had Doherty conducted a routine approach brief, as was required before every approach, Adcock may well have reconciled this clearance to being somewhat unusual. Why? Well, the approach brief is a mandated procedure whereby the pilot flying the aircraft formally outlines how he intends to conduct the approach approach configuration, speed, and landing distance performance calculations are all typically covered, as are specifics relating to the type of approach to be flown, namely visual ILS or non-precision, for example. In addition, and of relevance here, is also a review of the local topography and minimum altitudes to be flown, particularly where the arrival airport is located in a non-radar environment, as was the case with Santa Maria. Had such an examination been undertaken, Adcock would have realised that in order to satisfy terrain clearance criteria, the minimum safe altitude, or MSA, as the aircraft transitioned the island, would have been set at 3,000 feet and no lower. Yet these facts aside, someone on the flight deck, most probably Doherty himself, had heard correctly what the controller had said, and did correct Adcock's misinterpretation. Roger, we're cleared to 2000 and 1027. Make it three. Adcock, indicating some confusion with regard to the Q&H value just received, asked Doherty as to whether he had heard correctly. Is that what he said? 1027 on the millibars? Doherty, for his part, responded with a simple yeah, before starting into the approach checklist in preparation for landing the matter simply being glossed over. Critically, what Adcock did next was to play a huge part in sealing the fate of the 707 and all those on board. Why will never be known for sure, but there will be much speculation that perhaps distracted by the conversation relating to the Q&H, Adcock simply forgot about Doherty's timely and significant interjection with regard to the correct cleared altitude, 
and proceeded to set 2,000 feet rather than 3,000 feet in the altitude alert window. What this meant was that the oral reminder to the crew to level the aircraft would have occurred 500 feet in advance of this set value, namely 2,500 feet rather than 3,500 feet. So unless spotted by the crew and corrected, which regrettably never happened, by the time the alert is triggered, the aircraft will already be 500 feet below its cleared altitude. And being in a non-radar environment, no one external to the aircraft will be in a position to notice the altitude deviation. So in this brief interaction between captain and first officer, the former will catch Adcock's misinterpretation of the cleared altitude and make efforts to correct same. Adcock, for his part, will articulate reservations with regard the revised Q&H, which Doherty will apparently accept as fact without any further consideration, apparently convincing Adcock that all is as it should be. Doherty will make this assessment without reconciling the two figures, for if he had, he would quickly have realised that an 8 millibar change in sea level pressure in the space of the 12 minutes between reports was actually the sort of change one would associate with the passage of a Category 5 hurricane. And that most definitely wasn't happening over the Azores that afternoon. But tragically, through all this ambiguity, none of the three crew members, Doherty, Adcock or Gonzalez, ever attempted to resolve their confusion with the one person in a position to do just that, namely the trainee controller himself. But in the aftermath of the accident, one significant issue had troubled the investigation team. Why had the controller himself not corrected Adcock's misunderstanding? Surely he was listening for and subsequently would have corrected the first officer's mistake. In the course of time, when they finally examine and compare the transcripts of both the cockpit voice recorder and the air traffic control tapes, they will make a stunning discovery. At 13.56 and 47 Zulu, the air traffic control tapes clearly recorded the trainee controller instruct 1851 to descend to 3,000 feet using the erroneous Q&H setting of 1027 hectopascals. From the perspective of the cockpit voice recorder, this instruction was likewise and simultaneously recorded on 1851's flight deck, or at least most of it. What the investigators noticed was that the transmission was incomplete. Although the controller advised 1851 to anticipate the southerly runway, runway 19 for landing, this information was not recorded on the subsequent cockpit voice recorder transcript, meaning that it was never heard by any of the three crew members on the flight deck. Not in itself critical, but nonetheless puzzling. But this was not the only anomaly which was to come to light. While reviewing further the cockpit voice recorder transcript, they noticed that the record of Adcock's reply of 13, 56 and 59 seconds, where he stated his understanding that 1851 had been cleared not to 3,000 feet, but 2,000, did indeed exist. However, from the perspective of the air traffic control tapes, this transmission only reflected the revised Q&H of 1027. And that's it. Adcock's reference to 2,000 feet was missing, meaning that the controller was never aware of the first officer's error and that a critical misunderstanding had occurred. But why? Why did both tapes reflect a fundamentally different version of reality? Forensically aligning the timelines of both the air traffic control tapes and the cockpit voice recorder tapes, what the investigation team discovered was that with this initial clearance to descend to 3,000 feet, the controller momentarily paused in his delivery before completing his transmission. Critically, during this entire time, he continued to keep the transmit button of his radio depressed. In other words, despite the pause in constructing his statement, the controller's radio equipment remained in broadcast mode throughout. Adcock, however, on hearing the pause in the controller's transmission and not anticipating any further information, assumed incorrectly that the controller had said all that he had to say and critically began to transmit his reply. With both radios now in broadcast mode simultaneously, this simply had the effect of each cancelling the other out. 
The controller, when finished, believed that the crew of 1851 had received his transmission in its entirety. Adcock, by transmitting his intention to descend 2,000 feet, and having received no correction from the controller, understood his interpretation to be correct. As such, poor communication, flawed assumptions, poor flight path monitoring and overall compromised situational awareness. Saw the 707 descend on its approach to the island, finally levelling off at an indicated altitude of 2,000 feet on a QNH of 1027, just as it crossed the coastline overhead the parish of Santa Barbara. Ironically, had the 707 descended to 2,000 feet referenced the true sea level pressure datum of 1019, the aircraft would still have cleared the summit of Pico Alto, albeit by the slenderest of margins. However, when the altimetry discrepancy of 240 feet was factored in, with the aircraft flying at 2,000 feet referenced to the 1027 datum, then the true altitude becomes a mere 1,760 feet above sea level, regardless of what the altimeter actually displays. Sadly, insufficient to clear the mountain's summit, all but sealing the 707's fate. As 1851 crossed the eastern coastline of Santa Maria, overhead the parish of Santa Barbara, Father Zulmiro, the local parish priest, was below speaking with the carpenter in his workshop, close to the parish church. He would later recall that the weather that afternoon was generally good, However, not uncharacteristically, the summit of Pico Alto was shrouded in a layer of cloud which extended for some distance offshore. I heard a deafening noise from a jet. I was near the door, on the counter, so I went outside to see it. I pictured it perfectly, I was standing up, holding some things on my hand. I will never forget seeing that huge 4 inch plane, with its metal colored wings. You could easily see the bottom half, but the top was covered by fog. It was coming in really low, it appeared to be just 50 meters above my head. My first thought was that at that height, it would hit Pico Alto. It took 7 seconds, I counted them, since when he passed above me until a large bang was heard. It sounded like an earthquake. One, two minutes later, a large guest blew, bringing with it newspapers. Bills and tickets. I recognized the landlord from the newspapers, as I had learned it from an uncle. It was an Italian plane. Yet even despite all this, as 1851 passed overhead, Father Zulmiro below, Dardy and his crew were being given one last chance to save their aircraft and themselves. With the priest counting the final seven seconds to impact, coincidentally at the very same moment on the 707's flight deck, the ground proximity warning system sensing the rising terrain beneath the aircraft screamed out its alert, terrain. warning terrain. Doherty and his crew terrain. of the impending terrain. danger ahead. But unbelievably, despite clearly hearing the GPWS on the cockpit voice recorder, when the investigation team reviewed a flight data recorder, expecting to see a pilot response, they instead saw nothing. Not nothing in the sense that the recorder was damaged and that there was no evidence to review, but rather nothing meaning that despite the warning the crew had failed to make any effort to alter the aircraft's trajectory and avoid the terrain ahead. Doherty had simply held the aircraft straight and level resulting in impact with the summit of Pico Alto and the 707's complete destruction. The ground proximity warning system was a final line of defense, having the potential to save all those on board, but ultimately it failed. But it wasn't until some time later that the investigation team came to understand exactly why, and what they learned would come to epitomize everything that independent 1851 had come to be. Terrain, terrain, terrain.
Independent Air 1851 was scheduled to land at 1305 local, but by 1310 nothing had been heard from the aircraft. In the absence of any radar facilities on the island, the only recourse available to the controllers was to attempt to contact 1851 by voice communication on the various radio frequencies at their disposal. Yet despite multiple efforts to do so, they received no response, even with the help of other aircraft in the general area. Neither TAP 190 en route from Punta Delgada to Madeira, nor Air France 215 transiting the islands overhead, will have any success in reaching 1851. The aircraft had, for all intent and purpose, simply vanished. Coincidentally, the controllers overseeing 1851 were scheduled to be relieved of duty at 1330, with rotation of the afternoon shift. One of the controllers about to commence duty at 1330 entered the tower, bringing with him the confirmation all had been fearing. He informed the morning crew that they had just received a call from someone in Santa Barbara, saying that they had heard a loud bang and that shortly after paper began to fall from the sky. The chilling reality of why 1851 had failed to respond to their calls was now starting to sink in. Once the crash was confirmed some 10 kilometres from the airport, emergency procedures were immediately activated. Josie Boutelou, shift manager of the airport's fire and rescue service, recalled, Right away you sent an ambulance and a first response vehicle. As we had other planes landing, regulations say that we can't simply abandon the airport in case of an accident. We sent about a hundred of our men there. As this is a small island and everyone lives close to each other, once the fire chief arrived, we managed to gather another shift to move more staff into the area. In Santa Barbara, Father Zulmiro also went to check what happened. It was the noise that led me to go there. I got in my Renault 5, he brought along the old carpenter that was with me. We had to stop midway because of wreckage on the road, I was actually the first to hit up there. There was some fog, not very thick. As it was windy, it passed by on and off. You could see the trees that had been cut from above. Near the top of the peak the road was littered with debris. Part of the ridge's dense vegetation had been extensively wiped out. Concerned about survivors, Zulmiro went down the slope grabbing onto the vegetation in order to keep his balance, before coming across the first of the victims. It was slaughter. Meanwhile, the fire services had also reached the crash site. The controllers below recalled with sheer terror the initial radio communications from the rescue teams on site. Tower, it's a disaster up here, this is horrible, a horrible thing has happened here. There was an absolute, tilling silence. There were a few small fires here and there, that were easily controlled. We entered the woods and began calling. But we didn't get any answer, and that was when we saw the first bodies. Other eyewitness reports on scene recalled how The plane had broken into bits and bodies were spread over a huge area. They were thrown across that very steep slope. Bodies and pieces of bodies. Most were completely torn. Some of the guys started asking what were those red things spread over the vegetation. Then we began realizing that those were people, mixed with clothing. Later we even had to climb trees or cut them down so we could retrieve them all. On the first day alone more than 50 bodies were recovered. It was just after midnight, approximately 11 hours after the accident, that the first members of the investigation team arrived on the island, subsequently taking to the air the following morning at 9 in a Portuguese Air Force helicopter to survey the accident scene. Recovery of both the flight data and cockpit voice recorders was swift, with the investigation team in a position to send both back to Lisbon for analysis less than three days after the accident's occurrence. It soon became apparent that the 707 had hit Pico Alto's eastern slope, with the board determining that the impact occurred at a height of 1,795 feet, or 547 meters, striking a perimeter stone wall that lined the roadway which crested the peak summit. Lighter materials and engine components remained on the eastern side of the ridge, whereas most of the main wreckage, such as the wings and fuselage, were spread over a vast area on the western slope, indicating that at impact a significant portion of the wreckage had travelled forward and over the crest of the ridge due to the aircraft's forward inertia. 
Indicative of the force with which the aircraft struck, the investigators noted that a considerable number of mature trees near the summit, 30 to 40 centimetres in diameter, were simply sliced in two. In addition, they found a crater approximately 9 metres by 4.5 and, and 3 metres deep, which contained a large amount of completely destroyed fuselage interior. While one of the engines was found on the eastern face, some of its internal workings were located nearly 800 metres away on the other side of the ridge. Initial observations indicated a large impact scar on the hillside, with debris spread along a considerable amount of the ground, hinting that the aircraft had crashed at high velocity with a low shallow angle, not far removed from what would be considered straight and level flight. A fact which corroborated eyewitness accounts that the jet was flying normally without aggressive manoeuvres or apparent loss of control until hitting the peak. Such a flight trajectory would have been unlikely if structural failure had occurred in advance of the accident, as such scenarios will usually have an adverse effect on controllability, with the resultant erratic flight characteristics easily identifiable by eyewitnesses if present. This conclusion was supported by more thorough analysis. Investigators pointed out that the damage observed was consistent with a high-speed impact, with no indication of explosion, fire or foreign object damage prior to the aircraft's collision with the ridge. Examination of the aircraft's control systems indicated that these items were in the conditions expected after such an accident, and from what was observable, the position of the wings, slats and flaps matched that of the control lever positions in the cockpit. In addition, no signs of problems resulting from excessive wear or poor maintenance were found in any of the flight control cables or hydraulic systems. The aircraft's technical logbook, recovered from the wreckage, had no record of any significant defects requiring rectification. Besides excluding the possibility of mechanical failure, these initial examinations also quelled conjecture relating to the aircraft having crashed due to fuel starvation. Records stated that the 707 had departed Bergamo with just under 31,000 kilos of fuel. En route, consuming an average of just under 6,000 per hour, the target load would have easily satisfied the regulatory minimum requirement for the trip, with an additional 60 minutes or thereabouts in reserve should it be needed. In fact, recovered from the wreckage, the fuel gauge remnants corroborated this fact. Furthermore, aerial reconnaissance of the crash site clearly showed large areas of discoloured foliage and vegetation. Such discoloration is characteristic of jet fuel contamination and becomes apparent over a period of days following dispersal. Further confirmation of the fuel status on board came by way of evidence, in itself significant, relating to the status of the aircraft's four Pratt & Whitney JT3D turbofan engines. Conclusively, the investigation team had been convinced beyond any doubt that all four engines indeed were producing power at the moment of impact. Compressor fan blades were found bent opposite the direction of rotation, and specific parts had suffered what the subsequent report would describe as profound circumferential scratches, all indicative of a sudden deceleration force having been applied while the engines themselves were rotating at a high RPM. Again, none of this possible under conditions of fuel starvation. And so the evidence from various sources clearly pointed to the fact that 1851 had met its end, with more than adequate fuel reserves still remaining in its tanks. But if this was the case, how come there had been no post-impact fire of any notable significance, particularly given the fact that all four engines, the most likely of ignition sources, were operating normally at the time? Addressing this specific issue, the investigation team attributed this absence of fire to the physical separation of the engines from the aircraft's structure upon impact with the ridge. What they had found was that the four engines, ripped from the wings with the force of the collision, had remained on the eastern side of the ridge, the side from which the aircraft had approached the mountain, whereas the remainder of the wreckage, including fuselage and wings, had crested the ridge due to the aircraft's inertia and come to rest on the western side. In so doing, the potential fuel for any subsequent fire had been removed from the most obvious and likely ignition source. Furthermore, at the end of such a flight duration, the fuel on board would have been relatively cold, and as such could only have been ignited if atomized, with the resultant spray coming in contact with a significant ignition source. Even then, investigators stated that flame spread would have been slow, 
and if the initial fuel dispersal had soaked into the ground, as was most probably the case with this particular location, spreading of the fire would be considered unlikely. Although undoubtedly there had been a fire of sorts at the crash site, it was believed that this was most probably a flash fire involving some atomized fuel, but unsustained it had never ignited the bulk of the fuel reserves still retained in the 707's tanks. A broader examination of the aircraft's cargo manifest and weight and balance documentation highlighted nothing as being suspicious or out of the ordinary. Likewise, in the context of a potential terrorist act, no evidence was found of any in-flight explosion or suspected foul play. What did, however, raise a red flag for the investigation team was discovery in the wreckage of the altitude selector which clearly indicated a pilot selected altitude of 2,000 feet. With this as a reference, a forensic examination of both the air traffic control and cockpit voice recorder tapes was undertaken, ultimately bringing to light Adcock's mishearing of the clearance provided and the bizarre set of coincidences which conspired to keep the controller ignorant of that fact. Ultimately, all evidence pointed to one conclusion. This had been a tragic case of controlled flight into terrain, where a perfectly serviceable aircraft, through a series of interrelated errors and mishaps, had been flown in a controlled manner into terrain, resulting in its total destruction and the loss of all those on board. So what of the error chain I mentioned at the outset, this series of events, circumstances or actions, which pervades most accidents, links in a metaphorical chain, any one of which if broken, will influence the direction of subsequent events, meaning that the accident will never come to pass. Independent Air 1851 in this regard wasn't unique amongst aviation disasters, but the incredibly ironic way in which some of these links interacted with each other to facilitate the jet's demise makes this a valuable case study in how such chains can form and be perpetuated right under the noses of an unsuspecting crew. With regard to 1851, arguably the initial link in this accident chain occurred with Adcock's receipt of the flight's en route clearance from the Santa Maria Oceanic Controller. In his struggle to comprehend the clearance issued by Santa Maria, he made a number of errors in its readback, with certain pertinent information being omitted. His shortcomings were trapped initially by the controller, who, concerned that 1851 had indeed understood his instructions, made an effort to correct Adcock's reply. Yet despite his efforts, Adcock again failed to correctly interpret the clearance, this time significantly introducing the generic term Santa Maria when articulating the final waypoint of the received clearance, rather than the specific three-letter identifier of the actual navigation beacon to be used. Had Adcock, by way of experience or greater procedural discipline, handled these interactions better, 1851's subsequent lateral navigation would surely have taken them along the northern coast, as intended, to the Sierra Mike Alpha Beacon, rather than over the central highlands and the peak of Pico Alto, as they erroneously tracked directly towards the VOR. Noteworthy is also the obvious lack of any assistance or clarity provided to Adcock by any of his fellow crew members in the flight deck. One can only assume that in the absence of any correction on their part, they too were accepting of the clearance, and as such the error is not Adcock's alone, but rather one of the crews as a single cohesive unit. That said, although the Oceanic Controller had to his credit made a genuine effort to clarify the situation, with Adcock's second incorrect attempt to read back the clearance, the controller appears to have accepted identification of the final waypoint of Santa Maria as being confirmation that the crew of 1851 had indeed understood his intentions. However, he had been unambiguous with his initial clearance to proceed from the Echo intersection to the Sierra Mike Alpha NDB, but most probably predisposed to do so, he had chosen to interpret Santa Maria and the Sierra Mike Alpha to mean one and the same thing, and history will recall that this most definitely was not the case. Had he pushed Adcock to repeat verbatim the clearance he had issued in the first instance, rather than make subsequent assumptions as to what he believed the crew to understand, 
and without doubt 1851 would have followed a track to the north of the Central Highlands. But in truth, despite assigning each of the local navigation aids a specific three-letter identifier, calling all three the Santa Maria Beacon was surely an open invitation for confusion and ambiguity. Undoubtedly, had each of the beacons been identified by a different plain language name, then the conditions for ambiguity between Adcock and the controller would never have occurred in the first instance. Regrettably, however, this wasn't the case. Yet that said, had the VOR's interference issues been promulgated by way of a formal notice to inbound crews, or indeed had such issues been depicted on the navigational charts used by the crew of 1851, then in all likelihood Doherty and his crew may well have questioned their decision to track towards this beacon as being a correct and sensible course of action. But with this information only being known to those locally, Doherty saw a direct track across the mountain ridge as being a legitimate proposition. Having been handed off to the approach controller, it would be customary for both parties to clarify the intended route of flight, specifically as the approach controller would not have been the same individual who had previously issued the oceanic clearance containing the intended route of travel after passing the echo intersection. This, however, was never done, and so the assumption being made on the part of the approach controller was that 1851 was complying with the original clearance, that being to proceed direct to the Sierra Mike Alpha beacon on transiting the echo intersection. Being a non-radar environment, no one on the ground could actually follow in real time 1851's flight progress. Instead, they were completely reliant on the crew reporting of their position, altitude and speed at defined points along the route. Undoubtedly, had radar been available, not only would the controllers at Santa Maria Airport have been alerted in good time to 1851's deviation away from the intended track, but critically, they would have also been alerted to the flight's erroneous descent to 2,000 feet rather than their cleared altitude of 3,000. Doherty's failure to conduct the mandatory briefing to his crew meant that the descent and approach would be conducted with a certain level of unfamiliarity and ambiguity. Indeed, for Adcock, this was actually his first time to land in Santa Maria, so he had no prior experience at all to fall back on. Of the many operational topics the brief is structured to address, perhaps an overview of the local topography and minimum safe altitudes could be considered of most importance. Thus, had the crew been forewarned of what these values were, the perceived descent to 2,000 feet may well have resonated with Adcock as being inappropriate and his subsequent misselection of the altitude selector to 2,000 feet may never have happened. The trainee controller's incorrect transmission of the local Q&H undoubtedly played a significant part in the loss of 1851. Although in truth, it was this in conjunction with the crew's descent to the lower altitude of 2,000 feet, which sealed the jet's fate. On first contact with 1851, he had correctly passed the QNH as 1019 hectopascals, yet later in a subsequent transmission, he repeated the value as 1027 hectopascals, an 8 hectopascal difference equating to an altimetry error of about 240 feet. But why? In his post-accident interview, the trainee controller was unable to account for how he had made the error. As weather reports are updated and forwarded to air traffic control, procedure would call for the new report to be compared with the previous in an effort to identify any significant gross errors. Whether this actually happened remains unclear, although with the wind now out of the west from 270 degrees, the investigation team hypothesized that perhaps the error had come from the trainee's juxtapositioning of the two values. Considering that the controller was still under training, his actions were supposed to have been monitored continuously by the duty supervisor, and indeed that had been the case for the hours beforehand. However, at this most critical of junctures, the supervisor had been distracted by an incoming call on the tower's telephone, and as such, she had not noticed transmission of the incorrect Q&H figure. But it was arguably the communication overlap between the controller and Adcock which proved to be the most damaging of all. In pausing midway through his transmission, 
The controller had unintentionally invited Adcock to respond to his descent clearance, but with both radio sets being in transmission mode simultaneously, cancelling each other out, both had assumed that the other had heard what each had to say. The significant piece which had been lost was Adcock's mishearing of the descent clearance as being to 2,000 feet rather than 3,000, but neither party had appreciated that fact, and without any correction of his readback, Adcock had no reason to believe that anything other than his understanding was the correct one. Although the overlap was a case of extremely poor timing, bad luck and flawed assumption, its impact on the events which followed would have been mitigated if the trainee controller had simply followed standard procedure and instructed 1851 to read back the descent clearance which he had received. This readback, which although provided by Adcock, had for the reasons mentioned never been heard by the controller and so he had just continued on the assumption that things were progressing as he had expected. But the sad truth was that although Adcock had misheard the descent clearances 2,000 feet, the error had actually been caught by Doherty, who had informed Adcock that the correct value was actually 3,000. However, distracted by a simultaneous discussion regarding the Q&H value meant that Adcock, despite Doherty's interjection, nonetheless erroneously set 2,000 feet as the altitude to acquire, and Doherty failed to notice. This discussion regarding the Q&H was actually instigated by Adcock himself, with something inside him questioning the revised value he'd just been given. The overriding issue here is that obviously confused, Adcock had sought clarification from within the cockpit of 1851, never making any effort to clarify with the one individual who could resolve the issue, that being the controller himself. Had Adcock questioned directly the Q&H value he'd just received, Perhaps it may have forced the controller to take a second look, thus potentially trapping his previous error. Instead, the ensuing brief conversation between himself and his captain was sufficiently convincing for him to accept matters without further consideration. Had any of the three crew members who ever taken the time to rationalise the misgivings being verbalised and compared the two values, if indeed the first had been recorded somewhere in the cockpit, they would have quickly appreciated that an 8 hectopascal change in sea level pressure over such a short period of time was simply unrealistic. There was some suspicion that the crew's failure to monitor accurately the flight's progress, and in particular the misselected altitude for acquisition, was down to distracting conversation between themselves and an unknown visitor to the cockpit, assumed to be one of the cabin crew. With their focus elsewhere, this non-operational social chat was to be one of the final links in an error chain which was fast becoming complete. As the 707 descended towards the island, one last opportunity for redemption had still to be presented to the crew of Independent Air 1851, an opportunity which, if acted upon, would mitigate the effects of all previous links in the chain, ensuring that the accident would never come to pass. As the residents of Santa Barbara looked skyward to view the underside of the 707 as it passed low overhead, at that very same time the ground proximity warning system on the flight deck of 1851 sprung into life, clearly and loudly alerting Doherty and his crew to the imminent hidden danger ahead. Under such circumstances a pilot's trained response almost equates to a reflex action. Apply maximum power while simultaneously pitching the nose up and levelling the wings in order to get the maximum climb performance possible from the aircraft. Again and again, with time being the critical factor, pilots are trained to act first and rationalise what went wrong later, once the danger has passed. But in the case of 1851, despite the GPWS alert sounding uninterrupted for a continuous 7 seconds, neither Doherty nor Adcock made any attempt to alter the jet's trajectory, ensuring the final link in the chain was welded into place and the fate of the 707 sealed, along with all those on board. But for investigators painstakingly following each and every link in the error chain, the burning question was why? Why had this crew failed to respond, contrary to their training, to one of the most fundamental of in-flight alerts that a dangerous proximity to terrain in the vicinity existed? In order to get an answer to this question, the subsequent investigation had to look a lot closer at what this training actually encompassed. 
and what they were to find was yet another body blow in the story of Independent Air 1851. You'll recall from the outset that Independent Air had been obliged some years earlier to retrofit its two 707s with engine hush kits in order that they comply with the newly introduced federal noise regulations. What nobody really paid any great attention to at the time was the fact that these modifications had actually altered, albeit slightly, the jet's handling characteristics. In particular, approach speeds were generally increased to such an extent that the normal GPWS envelopes for the aircraft had to be likewise modified in order that that nuisance alerts weren't being continuously triggered. However, as Independence Air fleet of 707s was extremely small and thus no justification for the purchase of their own simulator equipment, the airline had entered into an agreement with a third party who would provide the equipment needed for pilot recurrent training. The significant issue, however, was that the simulator being used by Independence crews was not similarly modified, thus routinely while making approaches in the simulator at what crews correctly understood to be a valid approach speed, GPWS nuisance alerts would often be triggered. The common practice was that instructors would immediately intervene and instruct crews to ignore the warnings. Thus, over time, the crews had come to normalise such warnings, and particularly during the approach phase, a culture had developed whereby the alerts were disregarded, and in practice, this is exactly what the crew of 1851 had done, with catastrophic consequences. And so, in all, 15 opportunities have been presented to parry 1851 from its course of certain destruction on the summit of Pico Alto. But in their failure to capitalise on one opportunity after the next, the crew of 1851, the trainee controller, and his duty supervisor, each remained blissfully unaware of the links being continuously added to an extended error chain, which in this instance at least, had become unbreakable. Following ICAO guidelines, which called for a preliminary report to be released within 30 days of the accident, the Portuguese investigation team announced in early March 1989 their initial findings that the loss of Independent Air 1851 had been caused by the crew taking the aircraft below the area's minimum safe altitude whilst flying under instrument meteorological conditions, resulting in its subsequent controlled flight into terrain. Significantly, Although the team's responsibility is to establish reason and cause, it does not fall within their remit to apportion blame. Therefore, their oversight will not only focus on the accident directly, but also the wider aviation environment surrounding the accident events, such that any identifiable shortcomings which have the potential to negatively impact flight safety in the future can be addressed and rectified. One such example was discovery of the fact that a telecommunications tower located adjacent the impact site on the summit of Pico Alto had been erected without the necessary regulatory approval. In circumstances very similar to those surrounding the loss of Iberia 610, also available here on the channel, the tower's presence, although not directly impacting on the crash sequence, had in effect caused the mountain to grow by approximately 98 feet, and so the applicable minimum safe altitude above should, by right, have been adjusted accordingly in order to maintain the correct terrain clearance buffer of a thousand feet. But with the tower never having been approved in the first instance, this subsequent and necessary amendment to the minimum safe altitude had never been undertaken. On foot of this investigation, so subsequent crews operating into Santa Maria would thus observe the minimum safe altitude to be 3,100 feet, and not the erroneous 3,000 feet which had been previously promulgated. A further example of the investigation's positive influence would come from a revision of the airport's navigational charts. Subsequent to publication of the final report, crews operating into Santa Maria will now see advisory information depicted prominently on their charts stating that the Victor Sierra Mike VOR beacon is to be considered unusable in a direction out to the east between radial 060 and 130, beyond a distance of 20 nautical miles when flying at altitudes below 6,000 feet. 
But in truth, such oversights weren't exclusively a Portuguese issue. Back in the United States, the aircraft's country of registration, federal aviation inspectors with responsibility for oversight of independent air's day-to-day operations had ignored a series of requirements ironically issued by the FAA itself in 1987, which mandated revisions to the company's flight manuals and recurrent training programs. These requirements being issued in the wake of several accidents across the wider industry where crews had failed to react adequately to GPWS warnings. As such, it was clearly demonstrated that adequate GPWS training had not been conducted with the company's pilots, with the training device being used, failing to faithfully reproduce the performance of the aircraft in contravention of the regulatory requirements. And the inspectors had simply let the matter slide. Nevertheless, the lack of GPWS training was just one of several shortcomings highlighted by the investigators with regard to the airline supervision. At the time, the FAA assigned a Principal Operations Inspector, or a POI, to ensure that an airline was in legal compliance with all necessary regulations. In the context of independent air, their POI, in addition to two other carriers, had been overseeing their operations since 1987. Typically, he had spent about 25% of his time working with Independent, maintaining daily telephone contacts, visiting the corporation headquarters about three times a month, and actual on-aircraft flight inspections about twice per year. In total, this had amounted to just under 120 interactions a year, which the investigation team deemed to be adequate, although that said the efficiency of such visits could not be fully ascertained. In what the investigators believed was somewhat unusual, given that Independent Air only flew the Boeing 707 type, one would have expected that the assigned POI to have previous experience on the type. However, it transpired that this wasn't the case. He had, over the course of his visits, supervised a number of technical ground skill classes, but had never actually completed a full technical course on the aircraft. He'd also observed a number of simulator training details, but given his lack of experience, was not qualified to conduct check rides on those pilots he was observing. All things considered, therefore, the Portuguese investigators thus questioned whether the POI was ever aware of the performance implications of fitting the engine hush kits. Furthermore, it was revealed that in the three-year period between December 86 and January 89, there had been 12 checks on specific international operations, but Santa Maria had never been included. While noting the limited experience of crews in the context of international operations, the report pointed out that with regard such factors as foreign air traffic control phraseology and practices, POIs were not given any specific training with regard to how or what to focus their attention on. And so the whole aspect of preparing for and managing operations outside of the US was left rather loose for want of a better expression. Set against such a backdrop, when considering Adcock's suitability and preparedness for such flights, the investigation team made the following observations. One cannot forget an aliasing the instructions and training of the first officer when he joined the company. His flight training consisted of two simulator sessions and the third one was a check ride, with a total of five hours at the controls and six hours of observation, which is considered insufficient time according to this commission, but allowed under Article 121 for reduction of minimum times. The investigation team also highlighted that besides it being Adcock's very first time into Santa Maria, he'd only begun his line experience with independent air 15 days beforehand with his accumulation time on the 707 being a mere 64 hours, and his previous flying job having been single pilot operation on a seven-seater PA-31 Piper Navajo. One can further point out that the instructor, after the sea concession in the tour, although there was progress, considered the need for more practice. With that as a recommendation, check ride for the first officer was nonetheless planned for the next session, without this recommended additional training having been accomplished. But it was in relation to the human factor element, both on the ground and in the air, that the most thought-provoking of observations were noted. Psychology PhD and Chairman of the NTSB Human Performance Group, Dr. Malcolm Brenner, 
noted that the operational shortcomings involved in the accident seem so basic and well accepted by the crew that it's hard to picture them as having simply occurred for the first time in this flight. Arguing that the careless cockpit procedures seem more like accepted violations rather than temporary exceptions. He noted that it was simply incredible that one crew member verbally corrected the first officer's error by stating aloud that they were clear to 3,000 feet and not two. Yet this crew member still allowed the aircraft to descend below this level and into the mountain. He continued, Cautious adherence to standard operating procedures, SOPs, over time is designed to counter shortcomings due to temporary factors such as an inexperienced crew member, fatigue, and especially incorrect understanding of clearances. But, on the cockpit voice recording tapes, there was such widespread SOP carelessness that one has to suspect it had built up over time and become accepted as the normal way of doing business. While this crew might have benefited from better crew resource management training, Renner was of the clear opinion that they would have improved had there been better company enforcement of SOP compliance, asserting that the CRM violations were so fundamental, citing the crew's failure to review the relevant approach chart or to monitor the approach verbally, Darty's failure to ensure special monitoring of his new and experienced first officer, and the crew's failure to uphold the sterile cockpit concept in accommodating cabin crew socially on the flight deck, as being indicative of a company culture where gross SOP violations were habitual rather than isolated one-off occurrences. While considering the flight crew's actions to be perplexing, Brenner also articulated similar concerns in relation to air traffic control, where an inexperienced intern made fundamental mistakes which failed to be corrected by a supervisor. The controller gave the wrong altimeter setting and failed to solicit a proper read back. Where was his supervisor? The airport wasn't busy, so I find it hard to excuse her for not monitoring him more closely. I have to wonder if the supervisor was even listening. Hard to believe she was even present. And given the content of the final report, Brenner characterized the trainee controller as follows. I picture him as a very average or even weak candidate assigned to a remote facility, as Santa Maria was, where he would either gain experience or fail without doing much harm. During the course of the investigation, a number of 707 captains were solicited for their professional opinion as to whether or not they believed that the crew of 1851 could have avoided collision with the ridge top had they correctly reacted to the GPWS warning. Those who believed it possible highlighted the following factors in the crew's favour. Firstly, the aircraft was in the clean configuration with both flaps and gear retracted, thereby reducing aerodynamic drag. It was carrying a relatively light fuel load, and its engines would have been at a relatively high power setting at commencement of the escape manoeuvre, allowing for throttle up to maximum power within about 2-3 to three seconds. On the other hand, the aircraft was at 208 knots, not an ideal speed for a quick ascent, and a jet that size and weight wouldn't react immediately to a pull-up control input. However, that said, all 1851 had to do was climb as little as two to 300 feet in order to clear the summit of Pico Alto. All things considered so, most of the pilot's questions stated that it would have been possible to avoid impact, but also underlined that with only seven seconds of advanced warning, it would have certainly been a close call or near miss. Others were not so optimistic, considering that within such a small time frame, realistically, it would have been very difficult, if not outright impossible, to execute the manoeuvre in time. Their reservations were made cognizant of the anticipated lag in reaction time of typically one to two seconds, as the pilot initially heard the warning, process cognitively what it meant, and then made the necessary control input to effect a recovery, the anticipated benefit of which would most probably in itself be delayed due to the aircraft's own inertia. Under such circumstances, it was acknowledged by all that in the event of such a natural delayed response, in reality, the fate of the jet would be doomed. Thus, the consensus which prevailed was that Doherty and his crew being convinced that they were indeed flying at the correct altitude, 
would have been startled by activation of the GPWS warning system. Their bias in favour of their own previous actions would have made it challenging to quickly acknowledge and adapt to the alternative reality, incurring a delay with implementation of the recovery procedure, which ultimately would prove fatal. By descending below the minimum safe altitude of 3,000 feet and unable to see ahead of them, the crew of Independent 1851 had placed the jet in a dangerous position from which it could not be saved. According to Portuguese law, every accidental death must be subject to an inquiry by the Public Prosecution Office, which could lead to criminal charges involving persons or organisations involved in the occurrence. Due to the nation's judicial structure at the time, the inquest of Independent Air 1851 was handled by the District Court of Punta Delgada. As is normal in such cases, the Prosecutor's Office deliberated the decisions on the basis of an expert inquiry, which in this instance was to be the final report of the Portuguese air crash investigation team. Thus, the office's verdict could only be issued on foot of the report's publication, and so the legal review of proceedings was, in itself, only published a few months later in June of 1992. In their conclusions, state prosecutors determined that there was no evidence of technical problems or criminal action, and that the crew had deliberately descended the aircraft to 2,000 feet, in so doing, disregarding their aeronautical charts and instructions issued by the local air traffic controller. In their opinion, the weather, Adcock's inexperience, and the route generally were legitimately cited as contributing factors to the disaster. Regarding the communication overlap, the state prosecutors were of the opinion that regardless of the controller's failure to solicit a readback of the descent clearance, the crew should not have in any way descended below 3,000 feet, even if ATC had instructed them to do so, and thus had interpreted such action as being one of gross negligence. Whilst considering the trainee controller's transmission of the incorrect Q&H as clearly being an error, they believed that it was also incumbent on the crew to detect such a mistake, concluding that the pilots were thus either completely distracted are unaware of the basic principles of atmospheric pressure. Going further, they stated that blame for the accident could not be laid at the feet of air traffic control, as fundamentally the aircraft should not have been below 3,000 feet, re-emphasising that even at this altitude, and taking into account the incorrect Q&H being used, the aircraft would still have cleared the ridge by a considerable margin. Furthermore, independent of ATC involvement, the crew were also the ones ultimately responsible for the correct implementation of the GPWS escape manoeuvre, and this hadn't been done. In summary, therefore, the court spared Doherty and his crew little, concluding that they had acted with the greatest neglect, imprudence and carelessness, a finding which under different circumstances would have had all three faced charges of negligent manslaughter. However, the perpetrators had perished in the accident, and thus, under the Portuguese Criminal Code, that determined the case to be archived. But regardless of the Portuguese public prosecutor's determination, other parties were entitled to start their own civil actions, and as is common in such cases involving aircraft accidents, some of the victims' families did eventually file lawsuits against the carrier for damages. Such proceedings, however, come with a unique complexity, usually in the matter of jurisdiction. Typically, the passenger manifest comprises multiple nationalities. The aircraft departs one location for another, and any suspicion of pilot negligence may have actually occurred somewhere in between. Other parties or non-parties may have been at fault. And then comes the issue of corporate and aircraft registration. All of the above frequently give rise to debate as to where claims can be brought and exactly whose jurisdiction is actually applicable. In the defence, while acknowledging the company's neglect in certain aspects of the case, lawyers for independent air again tried to argue that some responsibility for the accident lay with air traffic control. However, this strategy had proved futile once before and was gaining little traction this time round either. Again, as was the previous experience in the Portuguese court, lawyers for the families were quick to point out that under ICAO rules of the air, it was the pilot's responsibility to ensure that the clearance issued to them was safe, and this they hadn't done. As such, 
any oversight by the controllers could not relieve the defendants of their liability. Independence legal team also claimed that the carrier was covered by the Warsaw Convention, which in regulating liability for international air transport had at the time a ceiling on financial compensation for victims of $75,000 each. However, the court's judgment was that such a ceiling was not applicable in cases of gross negligence, and ironically the airline themselves had earlier conceded that some element of negligence had been acknowledged. In light of all this fact, so, the US courts found in favour of the family members, through summary judgment, an independent heir was ordered to pay compensation to the tune of 34 million US dollars, the equivalent in today's money of 85 million. The fallout from the loss of Independent 1851 was ultimately to prove terminal for the airline. The public perception that it, along with others operating in the charter sector, conducted their business to a lesser standard than their scheduled airline counterparts meant that business became hard to find and contracts ongoing were not renewed or simply terminated. These factors, along with the order for financial compensation, was more pressure than the airline could withstand and it was forced out of business. And so concludes the story of Independent Air 1851, the loss of a perfectly serviceable aircraft and the 144 souls on board, on a remote mountain ridge in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, where an improbable series of shortcuts accepted by both the aircraft's crew and air traffic control, inexperience, distraction and overall compromised awareness, peppered with no small amount of bad misfortune, allowed for a very unlikely accident to occur on the afternoon of February 8th, 1989.